Hey everybody, this is Petey from Spin Rack, and we also have Calvin Ellis, ready to rock. Today, since you guys showed up, you showed up for the brothers, Sands, Mars, you showed up for our video, our um, reaction to Rob observations, Todd versus John Byrne. And you guys came out and gave us some views, and we thank you very much. Comment and um, subscribe and comment negative or positive, but no thumbs down. Just kind of, you know, like interact with us. Give us your ideas and your thoughts. Even though when I did the, um, the Frank Miller with the, the John Byrne was right, and a lot of people thought it, uh, Marvel um, brought image back when they got they hit bankruptcy. Even if you're wrong, we're here to correct and get the right news out. So now we want to get some more right news out. And um, today we're going to talk about, we're going to stay in that vein, not a versus, but we have right here is the, the book that never made it to finish the press was Image, Image United. And we're not going to talk about this. We're going to talk about Image Comics and how they kind of accelerated the comic crash, right? So comic and you know, and we talked about this a little bit of a difference of opinion, but the comic industry went through some booms and some crashes. When it started out in the, in the late 30s to the 40s, we had this big boom with Superman and Batman, Captain America, and then a bunch of other comic characters, of, I guess um, Captain Marvel, all these books started really selling for all these companies like Timely and National and Fawcett. And then when that fell from favor at the end of end of the end of the war and the McCarthy stuff happened, we had a a bust period, right? The only comic company that was kind of holding on, which was what was that? Um, EC Comics, that was really crushed, and all they had was Mad, which was still selling up till recently, where they finally stopped publication. So any chance for the fifties to have a boom was crushed by the you know the the hearings. And then the late 50s, we had the Flash leading to another revolution after that with Marvel. And then in the 70s, Marvel kind of had, they felt like they were retreading, but we had some signs of life. And in the 80s, late 70s, there was a big boom that just continued and continued and got bigger. And it wasn't just, you know, we'd look at it and we, we didn't know the X-Men. The X-Men was a poor seller, almost canceled. And then that one, that one boomed. And then next thing you know, you had books you didn't know were going to be a success, like G.I. Joe, The Nam. The books were popping up, the New Teen Titans. Stuff were really booming. The, the, the Legion, even though the Legion was always going on, they had, the Legion was kind of this thing that was like DC Secret, which only finally did their own series in the 70s. And it kept booming. It kept going. Then the X-Men just kept going to bigger sales, Punisher. And then the, the guy, the characters, the, these guys were the actual artists that were on those books we had we don't have jim lee here we got todd mcfarlane was on spider-man we had jim uh, rob liefeld jim lee jim lee is not he only did a cover for image united because he left willis potashio we had um eric larson come on spider-man after that all these guys were big names and that's mark sylvester is on x-men and wolverine and then they broke off will you take it from there I did my start with boom and bust. Give me your opening talks. Well, as we discussed earlier, <laughs> Marvel, Marvel's had a Marvel since the late sixties has had a tactic of flood the market, overload the zone, take up all the shelf space. And who did they learn that from? DC Comics. Mm. So, so we got a whole. I mean, if you look in the seventies when Marvel had no less than eight reprint books. Yes. That's from yeah. Marvel, Marvel yeah. Tales, Marvel Superheroes, uh Marvel, you know, uh, Amazing Adventures, all that type of stuff that they had going. And it was reprinting everything from the Fantastic Four to Spider-Man to Daredevil. All of these books were being all these books were being reprinted. All that takes up all that took up shelf space. So yeah. the 90s was in line with what Marvel does. And Marvel used to suck us in his kids with the hey, first issue collector's item first issue how many covers did they do that with they, they already did that with the collector's item classics meaning if you're a collector get this item it's a classic you want to put it away so they have been doing this for years 
The 90s, however, mm, there was a bit more steroids pumped into the system. Mm -hmm. And a good example, see, X-Men, I can understand. X-Men, I can understand. You, you spin off. I mean, even then, it took a while for it to happen because a lot of these guys with the original team never got a second look. They never got a book out of there. Barely a solo story. But with the new guys, the, the guy who was the breakout star was obviously Wolverine. And once he got the limited series and the limited series is good, you could see the reasoning, okay, this guy should get enough, this guy should get his own series. And then slowly but slowly, we got a little bit of mission creep, not so much a new series, but all these mini series and these extra issues. But that's to be expected, right? It's one of your most popular titles, if not your most popular title, you know, branch it out, flood the zone with it, you know, Marvel style. However, you had a character like the Punisher. Mm -hmm. And the Punisher, the fact that the Punisher had his own book and the book was selling well is uh, was phenomenal, mm -hmm. without a doubt. However, the Punisher had more titles going than Wolverine. The, you yes. had the Punisher, yeah. the Punisher War Journal, Punisher Arsenal, and then all these other books that they had coming out, all these side books that were coming out. And you, you would have to ask yourself, okay, the reading audience for the Punisher is it really that big? Is it to sustain this le to sustain this level? Maybe at one point, I mean, business model is expanding, contract, but they applied that same thing with the Punisher. We have the Punisher crossing over with the Midnight Suns and you know the Ghost. It, it, it became everywhere. Everybody gets a title. Mm -hmm. The Ghost Rider he gets his own title. But not only is the new Ghost Rider going to get a title, Johnny Blaze and the old Ghost Rider they're going to get a title. Midnight yeah. Suns. Those guys are good. You know, those guys are going to get a title. We're going to try something with Blade. If you were in this book, fine. And then exponentially across the board. That's Marvel. DC, DC would do their own stuff, but not with not to the extent what Marvel was doing. Because again, DC was still, hey, as long as we're number two, we don't care. Don't come for our number two. You mm -hmm. won't like us if you come for the number two. But Marvel's, Marvel already had this strategy, but Marvel had a certain amount of bandwidth within the market and because of that the amount of bandwidth they could expand and they also had the cushion to contract image comics everybody coming to image comics for the most part no exclusively they were all coming out of marvel yes they were, they were all coming out of marvel and they were following marvel's business model now while the market may have been able to sustain marvel and marvel's practices along with dc and everybody else the market was never designed to withstand two Marvel Comics, you know, selling strategies or uh, selling practices at the end of the day. So we got Marvel Comics and then we have Image Comics who, you know, surprise, surprise, wanted to be more, wanted to be Marvel Comics. Uh, I, I think I don't know if they ever said this out loud, but they would have been happy if they could have knocked off DC, which was never which was which was never going to happen as DC showed. But. Mm -hmm. They just didn't have the stable to do something like that. But you do the same thing. We're going to flood the zone, but not with Marvel's. Uh, I mean, it, we know like, you know, like in the 70s, in the 80s, if a book was late, they might do a reprint issue. Image, you can't do a reprint issue. You guys don't have enough books yet. And then the books are late. When the books are late, you're not making money on those books. And then eventually stuff catches up where people are like, you know what? For whatever reason, okay, it's time. I want to turn over these books. I can't sell them. There's no value in it. Oh, good. I'm not buying any more of this stuff. And then the once you lose the speculators, there's your contraction. Mm -hmm. Okay, you expect it. There's your contraction. But where Marvel would expand by, hey, I'm going to have four Punisher books because they're selling really well. Oh, it contracted to what it should be. Okay, maybe I'll have two. Maybe I'll have one Punisher book. Image had expanded the entire market. And now when you got guys saying, okay, all those guys who were coming in thinking that they were going to make some money off of it and these guys beg off, that's a serious contraction. A serious contraction. And who took it on the chin? The stores. Well, let's let's stick to, let's, let's go to one. I'm not stick, I'm not, is, um, the, when you bring out the Punisher is the best kind of business model. Because even though I do feel that... Um, you had Mike Barron on the, the the regular title. You had a couple of hot artists and Klaus Jansen right off of Dark Knight, and then Will Spatashi who kind of was in the image style with the same with like a not like Jim Lee but close to it. And they had that same sort of energy. 
So then you had Jim Lee doing the Punisher War Journal, and then you had what would become the X Team starting up on which would be the book that was right under the X Men. The Punisher books were like they, but they they were getting launched quicker than the X books. Like that, that was way quicker. X Men to New Mutants to X Factor was a very long time. Um, what's the name? Um, Excalibur was kind of just a fluke because they wanted to keep the artist and they had a book, another book that sold. Wolverine was the planned one, but as you said, um, they didn't have another Wolverine book. So it's like having that Punisher immediately after, maybe like 10 issues or so, having Jim Lee on Punisher War Journal and Will Spotashio, two artists that are, are appeared here. No, well, Jim Lee is not on this one. He did a, a cover, sorry to say that, but um, he, you know, the, like the two of these guys doing that book and the books were hot, not at X-Men level, but it was close. And it probably had the extra five or 10 cents on the cover price. And that sort of model, like immediately you have a cess, do another book. Now, when the image guys, they launch the right way. Hey, here's um, Youngblood, right? And then when Youngblood came out, the then you heard about um, Spawn, then Wildcats, and then you had what, Cyber Force or Savage, Savage Dragon might've been next. Shadowhawk. So it was a gradual thing, just like Marvel, DC, that sort of thing. But when you looked in the backup of these things, there would be an ad for another book, which was like, here's Youngblood and Brigade is coming out, plus an ad for Youngblood Zero. And you're like, wait, is this, aren't these books just coming out? <laughs> so you go in there like, what the hell? I mean, it's like you got um Young, well, Wildcats, and you got Union, and... Um, I don't think Super Patriot came out, but it was that sort of equivalent, not with Spawn either, but they would have these other titles that they would start to promote. And then this one's like issue one, then issue two is like three or four months. So one of my biggest issues, and with many people had the biggest issue, why they always was complaining about Image, was, as you just said, the late books. And the other problem is, is say you have, let's say, what can we do with, like, say, going for, I, I don't know if we can be able to see it. So say we have, I got the Rocketeer, right? I got the Rocketeer and hit Youngblood 2, right? So you got Youngblood 2, you got the Rocketeer, you kind of know what the, the Rocketeer is going to do. So you're like, I don't know about that. I'm taking more of Youngblood, Youngblood 2 and not the Rocketeer. That Youngblood 2 does not come out, right? The chance that this book, even if it's not a sure seller, you could say this could have some space and you'd be like, hey, there's no young blood too. Like the way the regretfully uh, fans like the older fans would be like, well, I'll wait for the next one. I'll wait for the young blood again. Or you could see a Dave Stevens book and you're like, oh, sweat. Let me pick that up, pick that up instead. Even though the fans got a little too savvy for their own good. I think having this thing where back in, in the past, if you had a late book, it was a kiss of death. And basically the fans would be like, I'm not waiting for like, um, I think uh, Neil Adams had, what was that um, thing he had the, with the female? Like the, the interest from Neil Adams' 1980s work had kind of waned after issue two took like forever to come out. So it's one of those things where it was reverse, but it worked at, at the, um, what's those guys? The retailers would kind of hold their money and image guys can work on that cushion. Hey, a million sales for, for um, for um, what's the name for for young blood? I can go to the cons. I can party. I can hang out. Friends of mine. Well, I don't. Want, I don't want to say. They always say go go to the worst option that they say about Rob. But you know, it's like everyone was getting these big successes, and then next you know the next book wouldn't come out. They'd be at the cons doing all this stuff, and this takes up shelf space. Now you had a lot of other titles that were, you know, there was interest like the same way the Silver Surfer when it was relaunched in, in um, 87, it was a big book. But then Marvel had flooded the market. That's when they went searching for Jim Starlin's like, hey, we need someone to bring some life back into this book. Cause we'd flood the market with the Silver Surfer books cause they had like, you know, Parable, um, then Slavers and maybe another Silver Surfer thing coming out. And now the book had waned and then people were saying that Cosmic doesn't sell anymore, even though the server was doing well, but they had like, you know, as you already said, all these other books. So it's the equivalent of having this thing where people are going for what was interested and it's kind of hard to, um, for the retailers, because the retailers are saying these 
I'm showing I'm showing you the, these are most of the characters. You got Young Blood, Cyber Force, Savage Dragon, Spawn, Wildcats are not shown here. I think I already said Young Blood and Shadow Hawk. You had these things that people must buy, but then they're late. And it's taking up empty space which you could put a new comic because everyone was trying to do comics and that was felt like the war was going to be you get the stuff out on time and they said nope we know the fans the fans are going to wait for us and they did and the retail is going to wait for these guys and that kind of took away the money you can make off of a book yeah you might make more off of a, a young blood thing but keeping that consistency for the fans when the fans would be like, oh, this is six times a year to X-Men. I'm not buying this. Oh, wait, X-Men's monthly? Let's buy it. Hey, <laughs> it gets the readership, that sort of thing. So it builds up that thing. Whereas, you know, as once you start realizing that your books aren't going to come out, hey, I, I don't have to buy anything this week. There's nothing, there's nothing here. But if we had the, we still had the kids, and I think we still had some kids with the X-Men stuff happening coming in there we still had a lot of collectors and speculators maybe those kids could buy something else and pick up another book that was going on and i think that's the first sin that image kind of said hey the late books people don't mind late books which ultimately take away the sales that the stores can make they can work on the cushion on these million dollar sales but at the same time it's not actual money you're basically you know, allowing the cushion to be your market rather than saying, hey, I lost money not having this book here. And then they couldn't even call um, Todd, Todd or Rod on this stuff or else they would say, um, all right, I have issue 21 ready. You're not gonna take this one, then um, I'm not gonna give you this. So something, some crazy stuff like that where it, they would be like in a bind where they'd have to do it. And then if you call them on it, they say, well, that retailer, he said something about Kirby. He said something nasty about Kirby. So that's why I kind of did this type of thing. So I think the late books and kind of showing you that you could put anybody on the title and it could be late really kind of hurt the industry. Whereas um, if these guys had actually, I think Jim Lee has said it, they'd actually done the work and filled the gap during the time and did like draw the first arc and say three parts will be you know resoliciting at this time and then do it like that rather than hey issue here four months later issue here then it's like you're not working on a cushion you're working on actual sales that you can make and then you could have been maximizing the money during this period where you're like you got million dollar sales and you got people stockpiling stuff not working on a cushion and saying well i'm not going to support what is it like a uh, night strike or whatever whatever, whatever what was it sleepwalker we like to say now we're not going to support sleepwalker because um you know we know the next young blood is coming here don't buy sleep don't buy that sleepwalker even though i got it on the shelf it's not going to do anything like sell the, the retailers were just kind of waiting to see what new book these guys were going to do so that's my first thing so it's a uh, i went on pretty long about that but i really feel uh the, that that those gaps and the putting the putting titles out soliciting titles and not publishing them really kind of led to a bigger problem in the industry oh. where we never got to that point you know what was what are you gonna say no look at the, i mean look at what the situation was though if even at marvel okay unless it was like an x-men book or yeah i mean i think at that time an x-men book what book was going to be selling millions of copies <clears throat> Mm -hmm. So these guys over here at Image are knocking it out of the park with stuff with unknown quantities like Youngblood. And then not you didn't sell 100,000 copies. OK, you sold a million copies here, a million copies here, a million copies here. They're doing record breaking numbers. How much impetus do you really have to keep this publishing up, to keep everything on time with the business sense if You've just made you've just made all the money, all the money that you probably would make in the next 15 years in one book. And no split, no split with Marvel. You're taking 80, you're taking 80 percent home and, and leaving 20 percent for your own company to stay alive. And that's Mind you, look, look at what Liefeld had to say 
he said, look, he was expecting that. He was he was expecting, hey, if I sell a hundred thousand copies, that's a hundred thousand dollars. That's where he was at. Mm -hmm. So he's like, look, if I do this right, I could probably make one point two million in the course of a year. That's with work. Yeah. That's with work at the end of the day. He exceeded, he exceeded what he was expecting in one month. In one month's time. That's another reason why Image had a hard time retaining talent. Because most of these guys were getting like all the money that they would have taken them ten years to make, and they were like, "Well, the hell with this. I'm yeah. going to, you know, I I'm going to Fiji. I'm slapping all the ass I can. You know, I got. It's really tough. You know, I've been in a situation where you make a good sale, mm -hmm. you make a good sale. You know, you made a sale for 40, 50, 60 grand, and what happens? You're like, well, for the next couple of months, I don't have to work so hard because <laughs> you know I got this nice cushion of money, and then you realize, oh, that cushion of money. It's not gonna last. I gotta get back to business. And now you now you're two months behind on the whole thing. And it affects, it does affect you. It does affect you. So but this is now a payday. This is a payday. And again, I, I think in terms of like McFarland Liefeld, they were getting all the money. They did the pencils, okay? They did the pencils, they did the story. That's the bulk of it. You paid out whatever pittance money you were gonna do for inks and colors and lettering. They were getting, all, they got all the money. Todd McFarlane, totally different animal. Everybody else, everybody else, catches catch can at the end of the day. And that's, uh, I mean, you, you look at, Syl I mean, you, you can look at Sylvester, Liefeld, uh, Jim Lee, Eric Larson, totally different entities at the end of the day. But once you're getting paid, okay, or rather, I'm not once you're getting paid. Once you've gotten paid, mm -hmm. and you no longer have to, you no longer have to worry about stuff. What, what are you doing? Yeah, well, that's the thing. One of the things that um, with Marvel at the time, Marvel was, you know, on the path to like not crashing it, but saying it can't stay at eight eight million. It, no way. Even though the because Tom Falco talks about going to his, his the well, the, it's more the bean counter. He says superiors, more the people that are watching the money and say, hey, you know, they had shareholders it's like. Can you get it? Get us another five percent or ten percent um, profit? You know, like up the profits again, another five percent this year. Can you do it again? And they kept trying, saying, "No, we're a business that has to sustain, and it's just a, it's just an even thing. We can't. We're not finding new readers. We have uh, the set amount of readers, even though every time you said that to someone, or say, Burn, he was the one who said it the loudest." You basically, people would be like, no, this is a new thing. We're finding new readers. We're finding new people. And then you find out that just like all the other periods, there's a turnover. Once the speculators are gone, there was a turnover with readers and some of them left. Maybe they left because of the late books. Maybe they left because of the quality. But the, you know, the other hard part on the image side is the fact that they spent so much money on the color and the paper. And it took, they were like, like comics had the Baxter, the Baxter thing, which had slowly morphed into something that was a little bit cheaper, even though it cost a little more than the original Baxter books. And next thing you know, Image said, no, we're doing in cover quality color throughout the book. We're doing better paper. And it's like, this put the, the comic thing it's almost the same price as the a magazine. Now they now comic the industry spent long and hard trying to keep the comics at a low price, and people were still complaining about the measly price of it going from you know twenty five cents when I was a kid to a dollar, right? And then image guys were pumping it up to being like the same level as a magazine. Well, at, ultimately comics should have made the you know the gradual price increase, but it was seen, deemed something for kids or something that could be like a dime store type thing. So you always pay in change or something like that. So the idea of the dollar kind of book, but it should have gone up in price. But now it was like, same way it is now, one comic is the equivalent of buying a magazine. And in the magazine, you might get a lot of ads, but the ads are offsetting the comics and comics had already thrown out all the ads. They already figured that, hey, we're making all our money. We don't need to have these ads in it. So they weren't even offsetting what it was costing to get this paper. And they didn't have any process to do that. So it kind of put the comic industry in a place where 
you know, you had to up the quality and that's what it's going to take when the, you get to the sustainable level, will they be able to keep up this sort of quality at the money that's coming in? They don't know what the s- sustainable level is, but you know, we got some, we got, I don't say they all, I mean, cause like now look at this here, this image here, the colors are decent, right? It's not brilliant, but it's just decent, colorful covers. I don't have a problem with the color, the you know the so-called toilet paper comic books and the coloring in that. We had a lot of great colorists in there, and during that period, we had a lot of great inkers, right? This is just one style of inking, which is cool. Danny, Mickey, any of the guys that are hot now, we've always had great inkers. But I think taking it and bringing it into a higher quality format kind of put it in a place where when we didn't have the newsstand and we didn't have this, it cost a lot more to make them. And, it, you know, then there's the success rates needed to be more definite if it was going to work. If not, it was going to just, like I think Barry Windsor Smith's um, Storyteller, you had something that was a gorgeous book on nice paper. And if it doesn't sell, like, you know, they just, they said they were basically losing money printing it. So it's kind of hard to do. So I think even though they did do, it's a good thing to bring up the quality. You have to remember there was a, you know, this kind of offset led to the royalties going to the pros when they started making money. Once you start upping the quality for the paper and all that, you need the sales to stay up at that high level or else it's going to be hard. But, you know, now you can't go back. You can't go back to, um, it was, I think, um, Dan, Dan DiDio and his um, Frank Miller Presents saying they did a loose print and it kind of costs them more to do that now because the process is kind of gone. So that's one of my things that I think um, I could either take it or leave it as far as quality. And I think they might have kind of put comics in a place where, you know, you needed to make more money to make it a success. So uh, it's, a, it's a tough thing to do because there's another big thing that kind of killed the comic industry, not killed it, but really, you know, maimed it. But the image guys, when they, when they kind of dealt with the talent, and I think you just mentioned it a little while ago, like kind of going, like poaching talent, but poaching hot talent. They were kind of like, they got to a point where at some point they were peers with Ron Lim, and then it seemed like they were looking at, well, Ron Lim isn't kind of our kind of guy type of thing. <laughs> like, and they were like, let's try to find a new hot guy instead of saying, who can we get? that can do a monthly book and won't run out of town two seconds after because it was even harder to get like established talents like um, Jerry Ordway and Mike Grell to do a monthly schedule when you're getting this type of money on these books. It'd be like, ah, and then go to the, we're having a con and the next thing you know, uh, what is it, a war, uh, Wild Star is late and um, what's it, uh, Shaman's Tears is late and then um, Who's that? Todd McFarlane, fi- you know, canceled those, or at least I think that he, he said he fired. I think he said he fired them or something like that. But oh, Shaman's uh, tears, Shaman's tears brings tears to the eyes. You look at it, look at that book. You, the title, those covers, that's everything you needed to bring people into the book. And then if you had kept up with it, you might have actually found an audience and actually developed a real story for it. Yeah, yeah. You might have been able to do that. But I mean, uh, I'll be honest. You just got five hundred thousand dollars for one book. You're not coming back. You're not coming back. You're not coming back. And then who are they dealing with? They're not dealing with. Uh, it's not like they're dealing with established professionals. And these guys would have looked at this like, oh my goodness, how much money? And that was later on when they were like, okay, let's get some of the guys in here who have the name recognition, and they'll get paid. And we know these guys will turn into stuff because they understand what it means to get a regular paycheck of this much. You were running with these young guns these young lions over here and they were like good grief one book i'm king of the jungle i'm out i'm going to bali i'm slapping these girls on the ass i'm snorting cocaine off titties that's where i'm going at the end of the day it, it was it, it was just amazing because it, it was a like a self-fulfilling prophecy but uh i mean going back to what you started with i mean if you didn't have image i think yeah you probably would have had the same thing with, with uh marvel and marvel did have that slightly with the Clone Saga, with Spider-Man, where there was such a backlash to the Clone Saga that you had, I mean, it was a serious issue. Pardon me. It was a serious issue for them, and it really did contract the Spider-Man books because it got to the point, I remember they put out something saying, we're going to 
we're going to reduce Spider-Man's output to just two books so we can really focus on the character. I.e., we can't sell as many books anymore because we pissed off too much of the audience. Well, okay? This is pretty much what we can sell at the end of the day. So without Image, you probably would have had the same situation, it, but it, it probably it would have taken longer. But yeah, likely if Marvel kept it up with the way that they were going, would have, mm-hmm. you would have had the same situation. Though, I don't know. Because the uh, the whole thing with the, the Clone Saga, that was a reflection of uh, DC's success with Death of Superman. And then, of course, the question is, well, do we still have Death of Superman if we never had Image? According to DC Comics, yes. That would have still happened anyway because it was they said it was never done as a response to, to Image, but as a response to the fact that they couldn't marry Lois and Clark off in the books because of the TV series. So, you know, if... You know, if you if you still have Death of Superman, yeah, I guess you still get Clone Saga because everybody wanted to mirror that success. But uh, if you take out Image, and if, as Image loves to tell us, the only reason why that happened was because DC needed to knock these guys back a peg, then I guess you don't. Maybe, you know, who knows what happens at the end of the day. I guess it depends on whichever narrative you believe. Well, I, that's the thing. I can't, I can't say that um, the Superman team wouldn't have done it because they said just one of their jokes when they had their meeting. What do we do next? Oh, we'll kill them. And they also had, um, you know, they want to break the, the Marvel ceiling. Say, who knows how far Marvel would have went without, with if the image guys had kind of, well, there's there's no way to really say that they would would have stayed because Todd was already out. But the idea of them, him staying with Spider-Man and these guys coming books that were, um, you know, kind of, they're making too much money not to be late on those books too and or doing like stick figures and having their assistants kind of finish it out, having Scott Williams finish out um, Jim Lee drawings and whatnot. They're making too much much money because they already showed us how they performed in their own. These are the books that they say, this is what I always wanted to do. And they wound up doing like Rob did a total of 10 issues of Youngblood. Um, I think Jim Lee did more of Wildcats, but that it was so spread out. But both of those two guys took a sabbatical like those guys did a sabbatical which really you know kind of got on the, their biggest um um cheerleader frank miller's nerves is like hey you don't write about doing a sabbatical like the same way you know frank miller was you know did ronin and then next thing you know he's got a batman project but you don't hear from him for a while and the next thing that comes out and that sort of thing there's no i'm on a sabbatical <laughs> it's just in between projects type of deal but um they had said so much of how much they were finally doing what they wanted to do and the next thing you know it's like oh man i just had a kid i just launched a company i think i need i need a vacation so i'm taking a sabbatical and it's like oh here rob is back and like now rob talked about his storytelling how strong it is whereas in the interviews he was kind of taking taking to you know listen to his critics saying you know we wouldn't know if i'm a good writer or not because we had a bad scripter whenever i get a chance to do young blood again we will at least i'm gonna have a different scripter on it and then maybe you guys will find out you know if the writing is bad or not that sort of thing so um hard you know, going back to the 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 ultimate thing of them doing this sort of weird put out flood the market you know still you know well you got money it's not really stealing talent so it's basically um taking any new guys that are out not getting any monthly guys to do their books and then at the end of the day marvel is one of the guys that kind of pushed the industry over the ledge but this kind of haphazard um, publishing is just kind of what really for me was the start of making it like making it not believable because i was at a period looking at the 90s like all right, maybe these guys, because I had, you know, if you've seen, like, like, I've had a lot of image books. It's like, maybe these guys are going to grow into something. Because I was like, we got Byrne, we got Miller, we got George Perez, we got all these guys that started out one way, and then they became John Byrne, they became Frank Miller, they became the big names that they were, and they morphed, whether you don't like what they morphed into, like um miller more from the daredevil to the dark knight and like they became something some had some similarities but different from what he was and to bigger success 
all the same, you know, like they all kind of took what they had when they started and were trying different things. And it felt like, all right, if you leave these guys and you got all the money and you got all the freedom, you'll kind of figure out your weaknesses and try to grow and try to do books. And anytime there was a chance that these guys were going to do something like, I guess Sylvester is different because Sylvester kind of went image mode. And then he kind of did books that were true to him, like The Darkness and um, Witchblade and stuff like that was more mystical type of stuff. So it kind of felt like he found himself at some point later. We have... also have to look at, uh, look at the run. I mean, Witchblade is a, without a doubt the bigger, uh, that was the big book. But mm -hmm. well, then he had his own issue with uh, with Michael Turner and Fathom. Mm -hmm. I mean, on, on a, this is a strictly side note. I, Michael Turner at one point his art was in high demand he passes away and it's like there's almost no interest in this guy's stuff at all which I, it, it's so curious it's so counterintuitive with the yes. way that stuff is supposed to work yes. but uh, it, it happens but so he, he, was, he, was, he was huge he was like he's on the in, what's it, identity crisis covers and his art is no way like the, the uh, Rags Morales art on the inside did you uh did you, did you read his run on Superman? He did a run on Superman. No, no, I didn't see that, no. I loved, he did a totally different costume design for Superman, which is one of the few that I actually thought, I was like, wow, I really like it. It's not something you can keep. Mm -hmm. But it was really cool for the three issues. It was really cool for the three issues, really nice art, and a, it was a popular storyline. Uh -huh. that. And it, well, you've already heard me go on about the Superman stuff. I was like, hey, this is a popular Superman storyline. You know what we should do? Never adapt it. <laughs> never, make <anything> to, <laughs> never make anything to connect to it. Never try to push it any further. But it was popular. I mean, it, it, it was. It, it's always a head. It, that's a double headbanger. And then uh, you look at the art that he did on the Superman, when he, his run on Superman Batman. Again, these are really popular storylines. They sold very well. Mm -hmm. And they re-released I think that's all. I mean, Aspen will re-release covers that he had that he had done, mm -hmm. and put those out as and put those out as variants. Those tend to do pretty well. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, again, that was a definite uh, uh, that was a definite di digression. But that's what you people tune in for, right? The digressions. And <laughs> so, you know, getting back to the mainstream, if you look at Sylvester, the you know, without a doubt, Witchblade is is that's his that's his anchor title. But which that's a book that ran for over ten years. Yeah, okay, that, that's a book that ran for over ten years, and it was a bankable, dependable book. It is still a book that holds up today in terms of resale. You had the show with Yancey Butler that came out, yes. and that's what's supposed to happen. That's what's supposed to happen. You know, it's supposed to be long, steady. I mean, yeah, if you come out with the big hit, that's great. But not every book is going to be. Not every book is going to be action comics. Fantastic Four, number one, Amazing Fantasy, fifteen, and those are your biggies. Not every book is going to come out and do and do that necessarily. It does take time to find an audience. What Image had was they had this great name appeal, and they were all coming from Marvel. I know that they, I know that they were not ignorant to the fact that they were going to have a lot of their following coming with them. And I mean, I was the kid who didn't know who any of the artists were. I may have liked the art. I didn't know who the artist was. I didn't know who the writer was mm -hmm. on a lot of these books because I read Superman to read Superman. I didn't read yeah. Superman because this guy was doing the art or this guy was writing the story. It would only be later on that I would re you know, read a book and say, hey, I really like this uh, story. I wonder who wrote it. Oh, it's Chuck Dixon. Oh, it's Chuck Dixon again. Oh, I guess I like Chuck Dixon's writing. Yes. Maybe I yeah. should read some more stuff. I was reading it because you know I'm a Batman fan. I'm a Superman fan. I'm a Spider-Man fan. That's where it was coming. But that was in the 90s that was different you had the guys who were following because of the creator because of the writer because of the artist so they had to know they were going to pull these they had, were going to pull these guys over and well again you know success success can kick your success can kick your tail just as well as failure and those guys got a ton of success at the end of the day and if it had been managed you probably wouldn't have had that contraction but like you said you can't go two, three, four, five, six months without the book coming out and then wonder why people don't want to read it anymore. And then, you know, it's sitting on the shelves. The store owners can't sell it. People who said, hey, I guess Image is you know, going to go belly up. I don't see anything here. I'm going to get out now. I'm going to make a run on these books now. And then, you, you know, you have like the crash in 1929 again because everybody's like trying to go. They can't get their money out. 
And there you go. And if there were, uh, let, let's say that because of speculation, you increased comic readership by 10%. Yeah. Well, let's, you probably don't have more than a million comic readers at any particular given time in the 90s. So that, that's what, you had a cushion of 100,000 people. That was your cushion. 100,000 people at the end of the day. That means all of the guys who came in, you got 100,000. So you're going to lose all of them. You lose the percentage of people who are speculating on your books. And it hit, and, and then, of course, the store owners can't the store owners can't keep up with it. You know, dominoes come over. Dominoes, you know, just fall. Sounds like brittle breaking bones. You know, just a terrible scene at the end of the day. But I usually, I have, as much as I can acknowledge that, yeah, Marvel without a doubt started this stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because these yeah. guys came over, these guys definitely came over and followed that model. At least the top guys, the guys who were making business decisions in terms of uh, their books and maybe image proper, without a doubt, those guys were following that model. But I still squarely lay it at Image Comics' feet because the missteps that they did and like, like the, some of the missteps that Marvel's doing right now with TV, they had so much going for them and so much goodwill yeah, yeah, going yeah. Them as well that a lot of people were like, no, this is it. This is the second coming of Marvel, and I don't want to miss this, and I want to be here from the ground up, and I'm not going to get caught out there. I didn't get a chance to have, I didn't get a chance to have those Silver Age books, but I'm going to make certain I'm here for this stuff yeah. right now. And then it comes out like, well, wait a minute, this was just a puff of smoke. What the hell with this? Well, that's the thing. When you get to, what was it? I think when Rob Liefeld was coming back to, um, to Young Blood on issue six, and it was like. He was trying to get to doing the, so the celebrity hero thing and less of the action. So he has some storytelling and some action. And then at some point he felt like, you know, his his book didn't have any teeth. And then next thing you know, he just kind of guns blaze, looked at Marcel Vestry's stuff and said, I need to put some more action in there. And I think the the chapel guy who's seen hanging up top there, he kind of, I thought it was, it was one of those guys that connected to hell, he goes to hell or something like that. And it was just like, what just happened here? So it's kind of one of those things and you've got 10 issues of a book that was like this. Uh, well, it's like the, it's similar to if you watch the movie, The Planet of the Apes, even though you have the apes running thing, you don't have the civilization that was before. At the same time, we found out that like Marvel is the, the people that sent the nuke out. And then at the end of the second one, the <laughs> when at the end, even though Charles hasn't hit, the the man is the one who destroys the world again. So it's kind of like the Marvel at the end of the day, which is what I always had to point, I always bring up is that Marvel's the one that got took themselves out of the newsstand. Marvel's the one that was trying to put themselves into the, like a specialty store where they would sell the comics and put the prices up and sell oh, like, mean, oh, so like, that whole that nonsense when they were trying to have the marvel store yep yeah that's what kind of really took the take going from the the newsstand is is like that idea that they were always against the idea they were losing money like the like they were losing money in this process of printing where we had to print double the amount of page now you're losing obviously the issues that are being mulched yes but at the same time, you haven't figured the better business and the comic book stores aren't a better business. It's a business that works, but it's a business that works on being with the newsstand. It's hand in hand. So it wasn't like it perfected it. And they were like, well, for our minds, it perfected it because it's 100% return. Just dump those comics off and we just get paid. So when we, you say, you see a book and it says, you know, total soul sellout, that means the retailers bought all of them, but no readers have bought it yet. And yes, it's close. Sometimes it's close. Sometimes it's less, that sort of thing. But it's not going to sustain you saying that there's a total sellout. You need the people to buy it. And the comic book stores had been a place where they weren't going to kind of sell books that they didn't think were good. And they're like, instead of being like a uh, you know, even the cheesy guy that used to be at that rugby store, like he would sell anything. He didn't know anything about comic books. And that was the hard part of going to him because at some point I wasn't going to go to Avenue H or the flea market. Well, the, the Avenue H people were from the flea market. So I wasn't going to get to all his stores. So I needed somewhere close. 
and you got a guy who's going to sell you everything and don't know anything, but that's what your job is. They'll be like, hey, don't pick that book up. Oh, yeah, pick this book up. <laughs> and that's so good. So, that guy at the rugby store. That guy at the rugby store is one of the reasons why I was able to get consistent comics. Love yes, that guy. Yes, yes. Okay. God bless you wherever you are. <laughs> this, world, this world or the next, because he put everything in there, and I was able to go. It was it, well, it was a. There was that place. There was another corner store. It was you know, but it, again, this was a long time ago when comics were more easily accessed. But the whole thing with the newsstand market was, if it didn't sell, they could send it back. Mm -hmm. So these guys, so these guys are like, yeah, sure, I'll take fifty copies. I'm going to send all forty nine back if I only sell one of them. They don't have any issue. They didn't have any issue with yeah. that. The direct market, of course, worked better because these guys are like, all right, fine. They're not taking fifty, but whatever they take, they're not sending it back to us. So we're definitely making more money. But then you had, you know, Marvel was like, well, let's even cut that out. Let's make our own store. We'll put yes. the books in there, and then that'll. And they're like, no, 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 no. That's not going to work. Why? Because you got to have the overhead for the stores. And all, like, you know, come on, you guys aren't thinking. You weren't thinking with the newsstand model. If you had just made that a little, if you had just tweaked that slightly, you mm -hmm. would still have newsstand comics. Instead, you instead they went ape scat over. <laughs> but because look, it, it's just what you said. Once these books come out, okay. Once these books come out, they're like, oh, 650,000 sold. No, that's how many those books got ordered. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's how many, that's how many the stores bought. The yeah. stores bought six hundred and fifty thousand. How many did the stores sell? We don't know. A sellout, okay, and a sellout that happens in like the last time I remember going to a store and I was looking hard for a book and I could not find it was Superman Bugs Bunny number one. Mm -hmm. I was looking for the first. I'm, that's happened a couple times. Like the, there was an Iron Fist limited series, and I could not find, I could not find that book regardless of what store I went to. All the guys would just shrug their shoulders and like sold out. It never turned into this book that was a big seller, but you could not find it in the you could not find it in the store. Superman, Bugs Bunny, same thing. It didn't turn into like a hundred dollar book because it was really, really popular, but the stores ordered that, and whatever they ordered, sold out. Okay, the other stuff when it's like six hundred and fifty thousand copies, you go to the store. Yeah, they still have that book. There's six hundred and fifty thousand copies ordered. Yeah, they got plenty of that. <laughs> so uh, that's why I had to give the you know Marvel at the end as a start and the Marvel end at the finish doing their taking the themselves out. You gotta of say it. The, hmm? No, you got to say it right. You got to say it right, Sam. You got to say it right. Come on. Come on, you did the whole Planet of the Apes. You did the whole Planet of the Apes, you know, uh, uh, illusion. You got to say it right. You going to do it or am I going to do it? What? They, they did it. Well, you do it then. They did it. Those bastards. I always knew they would. Damn you. Damn you out of hell. Yeah, so that, that that's the the Marvel the Marvel sin. Whether I can give them credit for publishing, you know, getting whether they slapped the artists that could barely draw, they kept the the monthly thing going as much as you can. Same with DC, they kept books out there. Well, as long as there was a, a um a boom, there were books out there from those two companies. Whether it be you know, event driven, no sort of barely any stories. Like I, I the bet the the best testament is that you have Rob, you have you have, you have Rob's thing at the New Mutants. You had Deadpool, which was a very big success from the miniseries to the comic book, and then you had Cable, right? And you had Cable two issue miniseries. I don't think there was much story in that two issue miniseries, but. It was successful, and then you had the cable series. You had an artist who had been doing some inking. He drew a couple comic books, but nowhere ready to do a monthly comic book. And the cable book was the the sorry, the sorry group in the X books. And I can say that because at the same time I was reading most of them. The only one that um, uh, was I reading? No, I think I was I was I was trailing off of them. But the it's sorry to say. The cable book was the saddest one of them. They were just throwing anyone in there. Um, at some point, I think Steve Scrouse did it, who worked on The Matrix, but he did wasn't there for that long because he was there for a while. And then next thing you know, you get um, who's that guy? Joe Casey and Jose Landron, that dude. So it's like you had someone. They finally figured out 
how to do a monthly cable series, but that's the closest way you see, but they still try to keep the book out. Whereas Image, I can't, they, they just reveled in the success and the money. And then when it was gone, they said they were sitting around pointing out the mistakes of Marvel and DC. When everyone, like the, when they were complaining, that's the thing, Burns was like, like saying, I was complaining about Marvel, I was about DC, and of course I'm gonna complain about Image. So it wasn't like these guys weren't, like wasn't like Frank Miller hadn't said in the 80s, all Marvel wants to put out is Teenage Mutant Ninjas. Like they were commenting on the practices of making the cash money for years, that they just want, Marvel wants to run away with the money and just flood the market with stuff. So they were just like, wait, we, you guys are just jealous. You guys are jealous. And it's just like, whenever there was an opportunity now, you know, Savage Dragon, obviously Eric Larson is doing the book that he always wanted to do and is still doing it. As soon as Jim Lee did the book that he said he, other book he said he wanted to do, Max Faraday, you remember that? Max Faraday? I remember Max Come Faraday. <laughs> so it's like, and then as soon as that didn't go to the big success, drop. Next thing you know, that was like the thing where he bailed on it so quick. And it's like, and then I looked at it recently, even though it's like, it's not put together, it still has some issues, but it's like, who knows? No, it wouldn't have been a, a great book, but it's just like, you you know, at some point you have to find yourself in there. And he decided, you know what, I'm not a writer. I'm going to stick with these other guys. And um, even though Marvel had sold him saying, hey, this guy was almost pre-med. You know, like <laughs> he's some good stock. He's taking over. He was almost. He was almost uh, we we got to be honest about this. He, he was almost pre med because he <laughs> came from an immigrant family. <laughs> We've heard this story before. Yeah, yeah. I was to make myself, well, can you come? What are you? If you're both of your family members, your mom and your dad are immigrants, they usually have a very high bar for education and they're willing to whip the snot out of you in order yeah. to get the grace that they want. So obviously he was almost pre-med. He didn't want to do it. <laughs> he didn't want to do it. He was yeah. probably sneaking drawing. The, he was. He probably he told the stories. He's doing these drawings and his father's like, if I see one more of these drawings, I'm going to beat you worse than the last time. <laughs> 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 and I did it. So you can't publicize it there. Jim Lee, I mean, a better example for me is Jim Lee's uh, Mr. Majestic. Okay. Because Mr. Majestic, Mr. Majestic, you know, Jim Lee was not subtle about this at all. That was supposed to be Superman done right, Mr. Mm -hmm. Majestic. This is Superman without all the, uh, you know, the heavy morality, and he can do this other type of stuff. And Mr. Mar Mr. Majestic, while, you know, Mr. Majestic at the end of the day had no mileage had no mileage at the end of the day, just to be quite honest, as Superman would not have had as much mileage had they not tweaked that guy early on and said, we got to get this. And once the mothers got after them and said, look, what kind of violence is this going on? I got my son reading this book. Yeah. And they said, okay, okay, no more killing. Uh, no more, you know, we're going to just throw this guy into the air. Whatever happens to him doesn't matter. We're not going to make Superman slam Bradley. Okay. He's going to, we're going to make him a little bit more forthright at the end of the day. Superman wouldn't have the mileage if those changes hadn't been made and the obvious it's obvious because he did have the mileage. Mm -hmm. Okay. If the idea was that we wanted Superman to be the guy, just come in and wreck shop. And you know, that was it. Then, you know, he would not, he would not have had that particular mileage, but he did. Those changes took to effect. Mr. Majestic Superman done right. Didn't have that particular mileage. All right. So, I mean, again, uh, I've, and I've said this before, Jim Lee can put in, he can turn in some piece of art, that is, in my opinion, like, oh, this is lazy. You know, you took all these shortcuts and it's still better than 99% of the guys out there. He's that good of an artist. A writer? No, absolutely not. And I, he identified those things. I think he identified those things uh, definitively, especially when he did the whole deal with bringing Wildstorm over to DC. And DC still says, hey, every once in a while, we'll let you try to push these characters. And, the, you know, the, we, we see where it goes. That is still... And that is still a remnant and relic, okay, of those of uh, those '90s practices with image uh, with image comics. And one of the reasons that, and again, they never what that mileage was just not there. Probably, I mean, I mean, you had some stuff that was. I mean, you've already spoken about Gen 13, 
uh, I thought I, you know, I spoke to uh, Shaman's Tears when they speak about Gen 13 in, in this particular show, but previously. But you know, you had some characters there where today those characters would be heralded just like Spawn if you had stayed with it. Yes. I mean, the closest thing, I mean, the only, the other, only other character that you got to compete with Spawn is Savage Dragon. And Savage Dragon, I don't know how many guys read that book. I don't even know if it's like, I have no idea what the print run is on Savage Dragon. It has a dedicated readership, but I couldn't tell you if it's three, 5,000 or 3,000. It's going to be really small out of the whole thing, and it's consistent. But, the, you know, it's Spawn, and that's it. Those There should have been other guys, too, to say, oh, yeah, we kept it up. Uh, we got Spawn going for 300. Now we got Young Blood's going to be coming up for 300. Now we've got Shaman's Tear is going to be, you know, that's what yeah. should have happened. Okay. But you got to, what is it? I mean, what do you do when you get a million dollars overnight? <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, that's a, one of the harder things to look at and say once, I mean, I didn't really look at it like that for everyone, for not necessarily Jerry Ordway, but I mean, the delays for you know, delays are going to happen in this sort of thing, but at the same time, you can offset the delays understanding the business. That's what the whole miniseries is about: is saying, "Hey, we got a miniseries coming up." Unless Way Marvel would do it and say, "Hey, that thing is on schedule now. You need to start. You're already behind schedule," which is what um, Jim Shooter would do from time to time. But ultimately. You, you're you're in control of your own destiny. You don't have a gym shooter on your back saying, we need to hit this now or we don't have a chance. And you know, once, if Youngblood- yeah, you, hmm? you need, they needed a gym shooter. You need <laughs> the, I mean, they needed a gym shooter. Who did they have that was gym shooter? They oh. had Todd McFarlane. That was the closest they had to gym shooter. And the, but the environment was that nobody had to listen to Todd McFarlane because everybody was their own entity. Everybody yeah. was their own man. They were free to do. They were free to do what they did. Okay, and the results are what they and the results are what they are. I mean, well, that's the other thing. Yeah. They don't get mad about Todd saying, "Hey, Todd is claiming, hey, my book is on time. What's going wrong with you guys?" And the next thing you know, they're like probably looking at him like, "Well, you got somebody else drawing in now." I was like, "Yo, what? It don't matter." What do you think? What do you think Marvel is about? You think you think you see at some point Kirby's not drawing the X Men or the Avengers? It's like get this book out. The, we can't have Kirby can't do everything. He can start some books. But we're gonna have to shuffle him off to something else. Let's get some other that's, artists. That's and that's just part of the business. You would have these guys say like somebody like Keith Pollard. He would come on Thor, and he's either coming on Thor to replace John Buscema, or he's coming on to spell John Buscema. But, you know, you would see how it would go. At, you know, at certain points, Keith Pollard is doing what? He's doing the cover and he's doing the interiors. Then it might be he's doing the interiors, he's not doing the cover. Then he's doing the cover and he's doing the, the layouts and somebody else is doing the breakdowns. And then eventually Keith Pollard is not on the book anymore. Keith, that's the Thank thing. You. That's what I envision after seeing Image fail so miserably, right? You got your book called young blood right you come up with every that's why you take these these scripters and say let's share it right so we can figure this out then you have so many people that can't do the monthly schedule you take the herb trimpies you take keith polar the guys that can do like the layouts hey just give me so you i see that you can see online like um uh what's the name herb trippy doing like X Force type layouts. Just get these guys to give you the layouts. Then you get your whatever guy you think is the penciler. Let them pencil or get these guys who are doing the inking. Get you these books to get these books out monthly. And then at the same time, the the thing that keeps you from running out of town is saying, "Here's your, here's your check for the work." And then six months later, here's your royalties, and you're like. Oh, I'm going to Cabo, but you got enough books on the shelf. That's the Marvel practice because they didn't know. Like that's what uh, um, Dave Cockrum. Well, Dave Cockrum had a different idea. He when he left X Men to do the Futurians, he received six months after leaving received the royalty check for his last couple issues because it just fell under the royalty program. And he's like, if I knew this, I would have never left the book. <laughs> 
and that's the thing. It was a delay process, whereas the image guys are just having the money. And not to say, oh, well, if they, 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 they delayed it, they would have kept the money anyway. So there's no way to escape. There's no way to escape this thing. Because I don't think that they had a real royalty program. They had cash up front type of thing. And basically their idea, since I think the way they shared books, like if Youngblood showed up in Wildcats, um, they didn't they didn't pay each other. They just said, hey, you want to use it? Yeah, use it. And then next thing you know, you get the Neil Gaiman situation where it's like, hey, you guys are creative rights guys, right? Why am I not seeing? I get money off of all these other books from DC. These are the, 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 the criminals and you guys haven't sent me a royalty check? He said, no, I sent you some checks. Some, uh, no, that was not. You said you're going to send me X, Y, Z. So uh, it's uh, you, the bad practices. And the problem is they also had sweatshops. They even had sweatshops. They had clubhouse. Sorry, they had clubhouses. But they worked the same way the sweatshops worked. They had assistants, people working on books. But they couldn't. They were saying there's a video you can look at now where it says, last year, we, we solicited seven and we got three. This year we're gonna do eight and we hope to get out six. So it's like, <laughs> like what the what kind of publishing thing is this that they're trying to do? Well, you have a you have the same thing as the, the shop, just like Schuster, um, Captain Marvel, uh, Batman. You had these shops where people were putting together, stockpiling, Basically, you look at the, I just looked at the first Superman issue. You've got a bunch of issues, a bunch of different stories in here. No connection to each other besides Superman and the lead cast. A totally different story, each like three or four stories that are in Superman number one. But it's like, that's the process of saying, I'm a publisher. I'm a publisher. I'm going to put content in here. If you're doing Kirby, figure out how to do 22 pages or whatever it is in the double splash page. You got three page covered with one single image, two, two single image that covers three pages. You can get through the rest of the book, but that's as a publisher. They kept talking about being a publisher. And at the end of the day, they were like, you know, they were, you know, the, you know, stuck in their success where they were like, let's, we got to keep up in the ante instead of saying, you know what? And then that led them to do less than more. So ultimately, I think they kind of jump started this whole thing. They, Marvel was there. They jump started it. And then Marvel said, hey, we're going to do the final straw. We're going to do our, we're going to do our, what's that thing? We're going to do our, our store, our Heroes World, like the Disney store. We're going to have a, a store where we sell comics. We're going to have somebody in the back selling back issues. And we're going to be raking in all that money because they kept looking at comic store like, dang, they looked at the, the new standard, like we're losing uh, losing money on those comics that are getting mulched and look at the comic store. It's like, man, we sold them them comics and now they're selling it for $10 each when we could have been like, well, how can we get some of that money? Like, no, that's a gradual process. Like, no, that's that's profit on top of the profit. How do we sell it to ourselves? And then wait a second, that's where you got have the problem. You're not selling to anyone. You're keeping it and having the kids come in there and they're gonna come to the mall, to the Marvel store, the Heroes World store, they get the toys and that, and nobody goes in. <laughs> and then it, it, it fails so quickly. And regretfully, DC took their books out of um the newsstand and they went with Diamond to sell to just stores, and you saw not only losing the newsstand, the stores started to fall the fall at the same time. We were losing stores. We're still losing stores because of the pandemic. You know, so it's a sad thing. And with this new, this was the, the renaissance. This was a new age. And they were at the new age. But at the same time, it was like you had the practice of people learning, people doing their popular books, becoming the top creators, going independent, which many creators had done before image before burn before miller and all those guys and they were like they we're looking at this guy's at the top of their success they're getting their own thing and then it's like the success kind of ruined this whole process but it's all forgotten now because even though i'm saying that the image you know, jump started the crash of the comic industry people look at image like hey look look at it it got the walking dead it had saga it's not all of the different stuff that they publish. 
like you know the all the quality stuff that's out there all the indie people that get to try and do their books and this that and the other and give them a chance and all this other stuff and it's just like you know robert kirkman had to be taking the court by was it um what's it the guy those, guys, those indie guys got a shot those indie guys got a shot because originally image was a new home for superheroes it didn't work mm -hmm. it, it really did you know it didn't work for, you know for all the reasons we said I will uh, disagree slightly. Well, you said it was a sweatshop. I will call it was a sweat box. <laughs> <laughs> it was a party. It was a clubhouse. It wasn't like the sweatshop. It wasn't like the es Eisner <laughs> thing. It wasn't that where a whole bunch of people at the thing. It's nobody working, saying, you got to get those pages. And the, the story of Rob Smack is, oh, sorry, I cut you off, so keep going. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. That was, uh, was a sweat box. <laughs> I mean, they, they, they did a 182 because first it was like, here, take all this money. They'd be like, oh, we're not getting any money. We're not giving you any money or anything of that nature because they saw what the, situ they saw what the situation was. Yeah. It, uh, I mean, um, it, it, I had, the other thing is, we're not, that's not coming out of malice because at the same time, you know, I struggle with, um, I guess, some of like Valentino before he did this, and I struggle with Liefeld. I think I liked pretty much all of the other guys in there, but um, it's uh, seeing that you know, seeing how these guys were at there, even though it was all books similar to what you know, or something that Marvel had, even if it wasn't their own books, um, it was just kind of like maybe you can kind of grow into something else. Maybe I was always looked at Liefeld as kind of taking some stuff from um, who is it? Um, Arthur Adams, um, Miller, and Kirby, and kind of putting it together, and just like saying, "Nope, we're not going any further beyond that." You know, where Arthur Adams started one way, and he got bulkier, and he got figured more into his um, finishing type of deal, kept pretty much uh, his style, but it's not the same way it was when it started, and that's what the kind of hard thing you'd see with these guys, where most of them have kept their style. I, I haven't seen Todd draw something by himself in a long time, so I can't really tell you. But if the thing of it is, if you're going to become, you're going to get 300 issues out of a book as an artist, you're going to need someone else to take it over because nobody outside of Kirby is going to do over 100 issues of drawing one book. It's just unheard of. So I'm, I'm OK with you getting someone else in there he wants to do finishing, that's fine. That's how many artists move from doing stuff to covers. It hurts, it breaks my heart seeing, I love the Adam Hughes' stuff, but it, you know, at some point you get the guys at my exec where you see less comic books and you see more covers. It's just what hey, happens. Look at, uh, nobody outside of Jack Kirby is gonna give you a hundred issues of one book, mm -hmm. uh, maybe like 30, 40 issues of another book, yeah. <laughs> 50 yep, issues yep. of another book, yes. and then a whole bunch of issues. And then a whole bunch of issues and covers and, you know, it, it, that was, you know, Jack Kirby was just a once, you know, not even once in a lifetime, just came once. That's it. This is a guy who really loved comics, loved drawing, loved creating. That's all that's going to happen there. The other stuff is just business. It's like how baseball changed. I, I'm never, I don't think I'm ever again going to see a pitcher who's going to pitch all nine innings. He's going to pitch a few innings. They're going to bring in middle relief and then they're going to hopefully bring in a good closer you know, that's just the way the game is played now. And that's the way that, you know, that's something that uh, happened with comics as well. But um, hmm. what can I say? Yeah, well, they know what they did. <laughs> the, the history is there. We know whose feet, we know whose feet, you know, to lay it at the end of the day. And uh, well, there's uh, one thing I do want to say that, uh, you know, I don't want to, I don't want this to be like, you know, Monday morning quarterbacking. Because there's a part of comics where guys just like to moan and, you know, just, oh, this is terrible. It was so much better when uh, this was going on. A lot of people were enjoying the 90s stuff. They mm -hmm. were enjoying it. And the only reason I'll, they'll say stuff now is because of the, you know, because of the crash that happened. Otherwise, a lot of these guys were reading this stuff and they were having fun with it. They were like, hey, let's see what let's see what comes next. You know, that's that's a big part of uh, being a comic reader where guys will give you six, seven, 12 issues. 
to see to make a decision as to where whether or not they're going to continue to buy this book, whether they like it, whether they're going to you know stay with the direction that you're going. You get a lot of time, even today. You get a lot of time when it comes to that with comics. But there's the other part of it where guys, you know, like where they have a page. Hey, what what is DC done? What is DC done stupid today? You know that yeah, sort of yeah. stuff. Where it's like, you know, there's a part of comics where it's just hating. But, you know, that self-loathing bit where it's like, oh, we got to make fun of this stuff because we like it and we really shouldn't. You know, we're looking at, you know, fantasy type characters in a modern setting. And I'm embarrassed that I enjoy it so much. Grown people running around in outfits. I, I knew I shouldn't enjoy this. It makes absolutely no sense. So let me hate on it with equal measure as much as I love it. So I don't want it to come across like that. But from a historical perspective, <clears throat> sorry, from his from, just from his, just from the historicity of comics at the end of the day, that is what happened. You, you had this big bustling thing that was driving and it hit DC Comics before it hit anybody else because DC Comics was the first people to actually, and the thing is, I have a hard time slating them for that because I thought the idea was pretty good. <laughs> but, uh, you know, DC Comics decided to try to do it with the 100 pages. 100 pages, you know, didn't go for, you know, for, you know, for a couple of reasons, not just the market. <clears throat> it, it didn't help to have a, it didn't help to, you know, to have a, an embargo on oil at the time. You know, it didn't help with that. And then, you know, Marvel keeps up the whole flood the zone. And from that, where do you go? Hmm. Yeah, no, it's a, it's um, way, the way this thing, the way this thing turned out. And that's the thing, when you see, like, um, I always bring, I bring up, like Gen 13, uh, you brought up, thankfully brought up um, Mike Turner and, and you also we had Wishblade and then you have um, the other Mike Turner book. Was it Fat <laughs> Fathom? That book. Fathom, that was his. That was, that was, that was another big thing for Image. Hmm? Hold on, hold on. Say that, say that part again. It we kind of broke up. Cal? Come on back. I think you hit a bad patch on the thing. So I'm gonna cover this. Come in when you when I, I'll let you know if I can hear you. Um I mean fathom. Oh, here we fathom, go, here we go. I mean I I've already gone board saying I saw comics. Comics. Hello? Yeah, I'm here. You're here. You're here. Can you, you you can hear me? I can hear you, yes. Fathom. And I've already been above board saying that I sell comics. People can still sell a whole bunch of Fathom comics today. There's a bunch of stuff where people still read it. They love the art. They'll collect it. You know, but it's just not, Mike, that, that book and his art was in such high demand while he was alive. I just don't understand the, the fall of, you know, when, when he passes when he passes away. And, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me because the art is still the art. And then, it, I mean, without a doubt, it influenced a whole bunch of guys. And he was one of the, he, again, was one of these guys who could draw women effectively. Mm -hmm. You know, he could draw women to the point where, you know, it, they were visually appealing and didn't just look like muscular, you know, they didn't look like men, uh, rather muscular men with just a woman's face, sort of like those old Renaissance painters, because they had never seen a woman's body, that type of stuff. So uh, without a doubt, you know, Michael, you know, Michael Turner's stuff was great. I mean, it was just a lot of fun re looking at his stuff. It was his own style. It was very, you know, it was very appealing. You, you, you have that type of stuff there. And of course, without a doubt, J. Scott Campbell with the stuff, you know, with the stuff that he was doing and still doing, as a matter of fact, even though he's mostly, well, he's a cover artist these days. <clears throat> yeah, so, yeah. you know, and that's no slight, but, you know, he's a, cover, he's a cover artist these days. I mean, you, you had some stuff over there that could and should have resonated, have, has resonated more. But for you had these bad practices and some, you know, some ideas where I don't think that, I don't think they were paying attention. I don't think they cared to pay attention. There was too much money. If you had looked at what happened, if you had looked at what happened to DC and what happened to DC wasn't because of lack of care yeah. or lack of planning or it was a bad idea. It was like some stuff that converged and they could not support that idea any longer. Okay. And then what these guys were doing, no, the planning and everything wasn't there. And I'm not sure where the expectation was. Marvel, it just finally caught up to, it, it took a while, but it finally caught up to Marvel at the end of the day. But, you know, there's a reason why we call them Marvel zombies. <laughs> well, that's the thing, like looking at the things that worked and people go to like, 
something like Supreme also. But and I'm tough on Alan Moore because it was like, you know, he would be on. It felt like anything like um, um, violate a bad rock. But if you look on the inside of was it Spawn Blood Feud that was written by him and the Violator series. You see his layouts that he was doing for Violator and the Spawn Blood series, where he was actually in the like the first image of the Violator as that wacky character, the bowl hit with the hair, like in this guy fighting this this guy who's like the term the Terminator. Like he actually drew an image that like Bart Sears pretty much kept the same way, and um, same with Blood Feud. Like he drew a like a page layout with how the titles would be and then and um tony daniels modeled that whole basically it was nothing there visually it was just like impeccable it was just like like that sort of energy is what i would love to see in that thing and you have a writer who's putting more energy into not the stylized art that you see here which is great you know it's nice nice figure posing but having someone come in and be like, okay, I'm doing this, um, these, you know, stuff that's not, not much there. I can kind of put something to it and put a lot of energy into it. So I'm, I've been very tough, but looking at those interiors and seeing that he did some layout, I don't think he laid out the whole book, but this guy writes like these scripts that are pretty large and he's doing layouts. Like that's a lot of work. He's working for that money. I know Rob likes to talk about it like, hey, he like, you know, was just kind of coming in for the money, like, hey, send me the 20, 20 grand or whatever it was. It was, you know, it was something like that, so that sort of thing. But, you know, like that sort of energy is what we wanted to see, like seeing like the writer actually do a layout that's usable. Like it's like not just stick figures, it's like a full, <laughs> full drawing. So uh, ultimately, that's one of the things I want to I'd love to see. I thought looking at Image United, I was like, you guys owe us, this is how I'm going to end it. You guys owe us to finish this thing because you were late. And okay, this was late. No, now this is indefinitely late. So I don't care how much good things they've done, Robert Kirkman, Saga, any of these other things that they've done, if, they, if the creators can't even finish this book that they started, can't even just say, Eric Larson, you just finished drawing it and we call it a day and put the book out and that's it. That's what you're supposed to do. These guys are just like, no, no, I gotta need to add some more flourishes. Oh, but I got my business to do. I don't got time for this imagery. Oh, well, we got the sales on the first thing. Issue three only sold that much. All right, we're out. <laughs> Let's go back to our day jobs. Nobody's interested in comics yet again. It's just like, yo, you just owe it to the fans to say here's seven issues done and take you know and this is uh say thank you guys for supporting us in the beginning and i don't think that they've done that sort of thing as far as what is old i guess they're not old anything we're not they're not they don't owe us anything but it's just the right thing to do but they're joking about it that they just talked about it a little bit just let eric larson finish it in between Savage Dragon and the Ant, he could get it done. And then you just have it published. It's the end of the day. Robert Kirkman and him, call it a day. He finished, uh, he did an arc on Supreme. Post, uh, the what's the name? Just let him finish it. But yeah, I think it's a, it's a still, this is a testament to image that this book didn't finish. So no matter how many great things they've done, how many success stories, how many people wrote writers that came to them and then went to Marvel for bigger success or that sort of thing. You got to just put the work there. And I understand you got families and all that, but don't solicit it until it's done. That's all you had to do. <laughs> the series well, of the series. I'm, I'm, in, I'm, in a, I'm on the other side of the world as I could care less if that series ever comes out. <laughs> I, I've also I've also made all my money on it. <laughs> I've also made wow, all my money on, on there too, huh? <laughs> yep. I've also made all my money on that series. So, you know, I, I'm good. You made money over this series? Oh, yeah. There were some variant covers that came out with Spawn, some nice stuff. I got all my money, so I'm okay. They don't ever have to put that out, but I've always looked at Image Comics with the same eye for the money. So, <laughs> I don't, wow. I don't, 
I don't expect the. I mean, that what you're saying right there, that would be great. But that's a Marvel or DC type move. And Image Comics was never a united mm-hmm. house. Mm-hmm. So the whole idea of Image United is sort of an oxymoron. <laughs> you, got what, you, know, you got what you got. Be happy with what you got. Yeah. All right. So this is our ex- how Image accelerated the comic book crash. Cal's version of it is how Image caused the trash. So we're gonna. I still have to give it to Marvel. Um, uh, Cal gives it all to Image. You guys pick which side. Most of you believe that they were they were to the greater good of the comic industry for the, possibly for their colors and their and I don't know what else. Um, some of the talent they brought in. That they didn't let the go to Marvel, but hey, here we go. Thank you guys for checking it out. Any other words, Cal? Uh, man, I'm trying to think if there's anything positive I can say about Image in terms of what they did for the comic industry. I mean, you did get, I mean, without a doubt, they were for a little bit of time, they were uh, a breeding ground for new talent, even though a lot of that talent they stole from Marvel and DC. So, you know, you did have, you know, some some talent there. It was a good place if you were an established writer where they were like, hey, come over here and you can do some stuff there. I thought a lot of that they did to buttress uh, image at the time because, you know, they weren't experienced. You know, once the, the initial success was, you know, after that three, four year, you know, years of hotness ran out, you had to start actually putting in some, some out some quality stuff as opposed to the quote unquote quality they told us they were giving us. Oh, man. I guess the best thing that Image did in terms of contributing to the uh, comic community, and this will sound like a backhanded compliment, but because of their early struggles and the mismanagement I think that they had in dealing with comics overall, it did become a place where if you're an independent writer and you have an idea that they also agree with, you can go there and give it a, you can go there and have a try and see if you can actually get some stuff done. And you may have the, I mean, well, Robert Kirkman's a different thing for me. I mean, cause this is, again, another guy coming. He was coming from Marvel. I could understand if he was, you know, hey, I got this idea and he was coming from out of nowhere. But he did have a little bit of a pedigree called Marvel Zombies before yeah. he got over there. But you still have other guys who were able to come over and they were able to find a place where they could get a, a big enough platform and push some of the and push some of the ideas that they had. I mean, that much you know you have to give, and that's still to today. You still have books like Saga, which would you know you don't know if that book would have ever found a home without a place like Image, uh, without a place like Image Comics right now. And um, I mean, that's the one that comes to my head. But and you definitely have other uh, books as well. It uh it, it has you know it has become something in the comic market where there's a, a home for a different type of book which initially was what image was supposed to be about it just went about it uh I guess they reverse engineered it if if nothing else yeah um yeah that's well that's uh you know we got a lot of energy and a lot of missteps and um. Ultimately, my my comic industry, uh, where I thought we'd get kind of the new renaissance and all the books I thought would kind of find some other life on other other things, they weren't able to make it, and uh, Hollywood came a calling. But um, yeah, um, there was some signs of life, and uh, and uh, we lost it. It was a bright moment for two seconds, and I think the image guys will blame it on their fellow pros that were complaining about it, but they were complaining for good reason, that there was all the practices that they fought to stop (laughs) happening. They kind of said, no, we can do this. You know, it's not like, I think, I think, um, I think Watchmen, the issue 12 was delayed. And I think DC said that it was going to be, wow, it's going to be better. It's going to be worth the wait. It's going to be even more detailed. And detail wise, it wasn't any more detailed. It just was the same quality of detail, no loss in quality, but you know, for some reason, outside of possibly them being famous, the book was delayed. And obviously it's the, the, the finale, so there was some cool images in there, but as far as his, the detail in his art, there was no real change in it and no need to change it because it was good, but it's just a good selling point to say, hey, this late book is gonna be even better when you get it 
three months from now or two months from now <laughs> or you have someone like um brian Bolin who's you know not really need to be tied down to a um um a monthly schedule so you don't get many books from him but yeah there brian, you go brian hmm? Bolin? Brian Boland, yeah, I mean, what? Brian's Brian Boland. Just take the covers and run. You know, what else do you really, what else do you really need at this point? But hey, I'll, I'll let you wrap it up. Oh yeah, so that's it. Um, thank you guys for watching. This is the, you know, not really a second part, but just kind of staying in that area. And thanks for viewing, even if it's uh, only a few of you this time. Thanks for everything, Spin Rack. Out. Here's my shutdown thing, bang, and I can't see anything, and...